Mr. Jeremy Soon, who is with us today to talk about social ecological transitions following natural disasters, lessons from the 2015 Nepal earthquakes. Dr. Spoon and I, in, in a sense, are siblings <laughs> because we graduated from the same institution. That may be a time difference, but <laughs> we, we share some of the same professors of science. They were still there when we were in the In fact, there are two more people who are siblings. Navin Rai, Navin Rai and uh, Dr. Billy Ramba. All three of us from Hawaii and Jeremy also is a PhD from Hawaii. Soon after completing his PhD, which was done in uh, Solukum, in, in the National Park area, uh, Jeremy joined Portland State University where he's an associate professor at the moment. And, uh, I read his write-ups <coughs> that are published in you know, anthropology, well-known anthropology journals like human ecology, environment anthropology, and also in a number of books and so on. So he's been very, very active as a researcher. And this is yet another example of how he is into uh, different issues with, of course, his feet firmly set on ecological and environmental anthropology. Now with that, I'd like to request Jeremy to give the talk. I want to thank Dr. Chetrick for helping this happen, and also uh, Dr. Dino Pokrel for helping to organize the talk today. Um, it's an honor for me to finally be doing a lecture here at TU in the Anthropology Department. Uh, it's something that I've been wanting to do for 12 years since I first affiliated here. Dr. Ram knows this. And it's a pleasure of mine to be able to get back and share some of these ideas. I also want to say that I'm only one person, but this project represents many other people. And two of those people are in this room, Dr. Mita Pradhan and Alyssa Rai. And also Christopher Milton in the back, who's our technical chief advisor. <laughs> um, all these folks, plus a whole research team that I'll introduce you to in the presentation, are part of this project, and I'm just here standing, trying to share it with everybody. So I speak in the uh, plural. This is our project, not my project. And uh, I want you all to know there are many other inputs into this, including Dr. Chetri as a senior advisor. Um, so, as Dr. Chetri mentioned, I started doing my work in Nepal in Solo Kumbu, and I was about to go on sabbatical one and a half years ago um, and go back to Solo Kumbu to update my PhD research after 10 years, and the earthquake happened right when I was planning on doing that, and my heart told me that I had to change what I was doing. So I actually got in touch with Dr. Mita and others and we started talking about what a project might be that could be useful at this time of transition in Nepal. And what you're going to see now is this work in progress. Uh, please know this, process, this project is not over. We're actually just starting. So the information I'm sharing today, we'll call it preliminary. And uh, it keeps growing. And I look forward to all your inputs and also your feedback, because this is a project that requires that. So thank you for that. Um, as an anthropologist, I firmly root this project in the anthropology of disaster. This is a, an up-and-coming literature from since the 1970s that by and large tries to understand how natural hazards plus vulnerability equals disasters. And how natural hazards do not necessarily need to be disasters, but often they are. Uh, ethnographic and survey research in these contexts can often uncover the dynamic, plural, and hybrid ways that communities understand and respond to natural hazards, how multiple actors function simultaneously and with fluidity in these contexts, 
and the ways in which political and economic factors influence recovery and reconstruction. Very important topic here in Nepal. And also how populations learn through experimentation and innovation, which changes their recovery trajectories. However, much of this research to date has been descriptive and based on a case study level, mostly qualitative, and lacking theory building that we can use to learn lessons that we can apply to another disaster. The anthropology of disaster literature is very much focused on how dynamic, how complex these contexts can be. But it's very difficult to read about a natural disaster, for example, in Haiti, and take the lessons from that earthquake and apply them to this earthquake. This earthquake. And our research is firmly rooted in trying to learn lessons that are generalizable, not just in Nepal, but globally. We place our research with under this banner of critical transitions or regime shifts, not a political regime shift, a social ecological one. Whether or not a social ecological system is resilient to a natural hazard or changes into another configuration depends on its capacity to absorb shock as to retain essential structures, processes, and feedbacks, and is capable of self-organizing, learning, and adaptation. Resilience, a term I'm sure you're familiar with, in the face of disaster often relies on human agency, the socio-culturally mediated capacity for people to act, and can be varied and improved through human interventions, also very important right now in the when an external shock, such as a huge earthquake, causes the socio-ecological system configuration to become untenable or unstable, a new system may emerge. This transformation or regime shift is a critical rebuilding stage. This stage, which typically follows a catastrophic event or collapse stage, is crucial but ephemeral time in which the system transforms quickly. It offers a unique opportunity in time to reform and reset a sociological system and set it onto a different trajectory than it was on before the earthquakes. This is why our funding came from the National Science Foundation RAPID program. Our idea was to get into the field as quickly as possible after the earthquake happened, but also to wait until the National Rebuilding Program started so that we could understand the full range of recovery trajectories within the population. This is the April 25th earthquake I'm sure you're all familiar with, and also the May 12th earthquake, which we also include in our research. The fatalities, everybody's pretty clear on. Also the injuries caused by these catastrophic events. And even more importantly, how many buildings and homes were destroyed. Some say $10 billion worth of Nepali infrastructure was destroyed by both earthquakes. Our main research question in this study is, what are the key social and cultural structures that drive how different social and ecological systems recover from the 2015 earthquakes? Our overall goal is to determine whether varied social and cultural structures, such as connectivity, institutional context, livelihood diversity, and social memory, and so on, are useful indicators of adaptive capacity to natural hazards, especially in mountain ecosystems. We're trying to understand how socio-ecological systems respond and what factors are the most important to this response. Why did we pick to do this in Nepal, other than my love for Nepal and time spent here in the past? Nearly 80% of Nepal relies on subsistence agriculture, pastoralism, and the harvest of timber and non-timber forest products in largely geographically hill and mountain areas. Many communities are only recently integrating into broader market economies. Proliferation of aid organizations in Nepal before the disaster. This is a big topic now in the news. Political instability festering since before the 2006 Janandalan II and the contested first permanent constitution was only first signed in September of 2015. Community forestry also fostered a strong tradition of decentralized participatory rulemaking and monitoring. And connections from tourism and wage labor abroad have circumvented some reliance on the state for resources. 
Timing, why did we do this project, when we're doing it. Our study focuses on the state of socio-ecological systems before the earthquakes and recovery trajectories 36 to 46 weeks and 68 to 78 weeks following the event. In the anthropology of disaster literature, by and large it is estimated it takes up to 10 years for a full recovery from an earthquake, but it's divided into four different stages. The initial relief time, the start of regaining basic essentials, reconstructions of livelihoods and other intangible aspects, and then something that they call betterment, or what comes next. Many of us here have heard this idea of building back better. That would be the time in which we would see some of those changes. Therefore, research on something like the Nepal earthquakes cannot just be conducted within one year of the earthquakes, but actually needs to be a longitudinal study that follows a certain amount of time. We wanted to make sure that certain events had happened in Nepal before we started the project, but we also wanted to catch this special time when things are happening so quickly in the field. We have seen changes between our first research phase and second research phase within a six month period that are quite extreme. And if we were only coming here once a year, we would miss some of that. So that's why right now we're concentrating on doing the field work at this stage. Also, we have proposals in to continue this research for another three to five years. The timing of this project will allow our team to collect information on the pre-earthquake states, the emergency response, the restoration of basic essentials, and the start of livelihood construction. It will provide a window into transformation processes at the earliest stages, setting a foundation for a longer-term project that follows social and ecological reconstruction in the targeted areas over multiple years. So we're definitely in this for the long haul. How did we pick where we're working? We decided to select two of the highly impacted districts by the earthquakes. Twelve were designated, as people know. Or fourteen. Fourteen were designated, sorry, as people know. And we selected two. And then we also selected two BBCs in each district for comparison. Our primary selection criteria were to select one BBC that was more accessible, one that was less accessible, one that had more aid, one that had less aid, one that was more market integrated, one that was less market integrated, one that was impacted by hydropower development, and one that's impacted less by hydropower development. Our secondary criteria, more ethnically and linguistically diverse versus less, more tourism versus less, more centralized governance and resource management, and more decentralized governance. Also, as part of our project, we wanted to have a capacity building and rapport building component. You will notice that our entire team, except for Chris, our new intern on the project, are Nepali people, and that was very important for us when we created this project, to be able to train new graduates, which we were able to contact through the Mountain Institute, as well as the Resources Himalaya Foundation. We recruited senior technical advisors, two that are in this room, project coordinators, and research assistants that all had interest and personal investment in the project. It had to be a labor of love or passion, or we did not want folks to be part of it. We conducted training workshops for the research team on ethics, theory, and methods related to the project with 14 different modules. And I'd be happy to share those 14 modules with anybody who's interested in this room on how we did the trainings to conduct the work. We also carried out multiple community meetings in each selected BBC to introduce the project, present preliminary and final results, and solicit feedback. And we plan to do that throughout the entire project. I just returned from Gorka conducting community meetings this week, where we presented preliminary results from phase one, which you'll also hear today. For data collection, we're doing it in two phases. One, January and April 2016 where we conducted a household survey with 100 randomly selected households in each VDC, 400 households total, which, is, uh, which represented 1,992 individuals. Quite a large study for an anthropologist. We conducted in-depth key consultant interviews with 10 individuals per VDC, 40 total. We have just about 80 hours of those interviews recorded and fully transcribed. 
We also did GIS mapping of the entire sample. So we were able to geographically situate everybody that was part of the sample within the VDCs and so on. And you'll see that today as well. For phase two, which is going on right now, September to November 2016, we plan to recontact all the 400 participating households, 100 per VDC, and then also conduct focus groups with key consultants. We're doing about two to four in each VDC. The focus groups being an alternative method where we're bringing together key knowledge holders in more of a group setting rather than in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And we're playing with a little bit how the information will differ. We're also GIS mapping community infrastructure and recovery trajectories. And we're mapping, for example, the VDC buildings, the health posts, water resources, schools, and religious sites. Both data sets will represent three points in time because in the first phase we did a retrospective survey as well. And that will be immediately before the earthquakes, 36 to 46 weeks, and 68 to 78 weeks after. We employ the rule of hand to select three to five key classes of indicator variables that express adaptive capacity to the earthquakes and follow them over time. This will illustrate socio-ecological transformation in the selected communities without picking so many variables that the data set is too noisy. Our survey questions were guided by indicator variables in a similar study who employed the rule of hand to do forest adaptation and innovation after a hurricane in Mexico. Here are the variables. Biophysical attributes, Characteristics integral to the ecological system structure and processes prior to the disturbance. Institutional context, the governance of the socio-ecological system. Connectivity, flows of information, knowledge, resources, and linkages between the system and external actors. Livelihood diversity, diverse patterns of resource use and heterogeneity of income. And lastly, social memory, prior experiences with disturbances. For data analysis, we're analyzing our survey data using descriptive statistics to create hypotheses. We're doing that today, and I'll be presenting some of those results. And we're going to follow with the multivariate, non-metric, multi-dimensional scaling ordination to help select, refine, or even plant the indicators with our own. The ordination shows variation between answers that folks give on multiple scales, and you can use both multiple independent and dependent variables, which makes it quite a useful technique for the type of study we're doing with so much complexity. This technique is often used in the natural sciences and ecology because there's so many variables within an ecological system. New to anthropology. We developed a recovery metric from the data to quantify tangible adaptive capacity and transformation processes at the individual and community levels, such as rebuilding of homes and recovery of livestock. We will also use qualitative data to help understand the quantitative results and the intangible aspects of recovery, such as perceptions of risk and disaster preparedness or re return or remaking of place-based everyday religious practice. A big critique against looking at recovery is that folks only look at the tangible aspects. You lost five cows, you have five cows back, now you're recovered. There are many intangible aspects of recovery that are hard to get at with quantitative methods, and therefore we employ a mixed methods approach to try and understand these other aspects, including psychological trauma and other aspects that people would feel. That I'll explain in a moment. We will evaluate how well the indicators I shared with you predict change in a recovery metric across the three points in time. For example, we will overlay the indicator variables over the plots that we made of the recovery metric and see what types of clusters and patterns we're going to find. Change in our indicator variables over time will suggest nascent processes of transformation and perhaps even provide evidence of a critical transition Although the strength and robustness of our model for assessing adaptive capacity cannot be fully integrated and evaluated until we track it for a long period of time. And as I told you, we have additional proposals out to continue this research. And my hope is that this research will span up to 10 years. 
Our recovery metric, in the tangible sense, is an index expressing the as tangible aspects of recovery. And these include home reconstruction, recovery of livestock herding practice, recovery of sale of livestock products, recovery of and access to three types of agricultural and horticultural fields, standing crops and seed storage, access to natural resource harvest areas, ability to work as wage labor, ability to work in tourism, access to electricity, and lastly, access to communications technology. Obviously, every site does not, this recovery metric is not relevant for. So each site has its own recovery, and then we generalize out a broader sense to be able to compare the different sites. Here are the selected VDCs in Borka and Rasua district that we decided to pick. They are Kashigao and Aruchinote, Gatlang and Haku. Aruchinote and Gatlang are the more accessible, and Kashigao and Haku are the less accessible. What do I mean by that? Aruchinote and Gatlang are accessible by road. Kashigao and Haku are not. Aruchinote and Kashigao, Aruchinote and Gatlang also have more aid, presence of more INGOs, NGOs. These other areas have less. Aruchinote and Haku are both impacted by major hydropower development, such as the Budugandaki Dam and the, what they call the 216 with, for the Upper Trisuli Dam. About four of the wards, and specifically two of them, have access to roads, whereas the other ones have much less access and are only accessible on foot. Uh, here you'll see two buses that go for part of the VDC and on the border of the next VDC. And also the Budugandaki River, which is going to be very, very important depending on the time schedule of the Budugandaki Dam, because everything you're looking at in these pictures will be in the inundation zone and underwater. Here are some pictures from the site. Um, this is actually the area in the upper wards. It looks like night and day from the lower ones. One of the big results that we have that I'll share with you in our quantitative results is that most of the aid is being concentrated in the bizarre area. And these upper wards, it's as if the earthquake just happened. They've received absolutely no assistance, especially from the INGOs. And it's very difficult for them even to get the government aid, although they've received it, because they have to walk to get it into the Aragon Bazaar, which is even more challenging for the other VDC we work in, where you have to walk for multiple days to get to where the funds are being distributed. Uh, this is a school that's actually in use in Aragonote. You'll notice it has earthquake damage. It's sort of a temporary learning center, sort of a permanent school, and life is just going on as normal in these circumstances. The Budugandaki Dam I've already shared with you being a very big driver of change. So in this area, you have a concentration of, of the aid in certain wards that are all going to be in the inundation zone. And all the wards that are not in the inundation zone have not received any of the help. I also want to mention that many of those areas are not rebuilding on their own either, which you're going to see examples of in other areas. Let's move now to Kashigao. This is our less successful settlement in Gorka. You'll notice quite a cluster of the households and where they are is really broken up into three settlements, Yartsa, Kashigao, and Chamakarka. And all of them are basically at the top of the watershed and below them are their fields, although we do have some fields going up this way. The elevation runs up this way and down this way. Uh, Yartsa and Chamakarka, and especially Yartsa, are dramatically different than Kashigao, which does have a helicopter landing place and is also where the BDC building is and any other infrastructure, the health post is all in Kashigao. Uh, here's some photos for you. This is Yartsa. This is Kashigao. This is uh, the fields looking from Chamakarka. Notice all of the landslides in the distance. Just on the other side of this hill is Barkbach. Landslides have been impacting this community well before the earthquakes ever happened. It's one of the biggest natural hazards that they've experienced. I'm going to show you some data on that. And they've experienced everything from landslides cutting off their access to grazing areas to actually landslides causing a, a, a lake in the, in the river and then that, that dam bursting and causing flooding further downstream. I, they call that a, uh, I forget, a, a lake, I forget. Glove. Not a glove, it's not a glacier. Uh, <coughs> um, it's a 
I forget, a landslide dam. A Laduff. A Laduff, a landslide dam, overflow flood. There you go. Okay. Uh, this is an active landslide. These are photos from um, one month ago where you have folks actually having to cross the landslide daily. They have to remake the trail daily. I'd also like to point out that the soil here looks quite darker than it does over here. That's because it's inundated with water from the long monsoon. The monsoon this year, as all of you know, kept going and going and going. And in places like Kashigao, it became quite, quite dangerous to be able to even access uh, places to gather non-timber forest products, to do grazing. I'm sure some folks here have heard of the Karunja BDC, which is just north of here, where some tourists were killed down by the Budagadaki River. It's also one of the most catastrophic landslides that happened in the entire earthquake, not far from here. And this is actually the way there. Uh, here's another view from within the landslides, and you can see how many landslides are in the distance. You're completely surrounded 360 degrees by landslides in this place, quite biophysically vulnerable. And that has existed for folks' settlement there their entire time, and they have stories about this going back hundreds of years of how they dealt with this landslide risk. Also very uh, prevalent within Kashigao is the tradition of karma, or work exchange. And we saw actually many examples of parma happening where folks were helping to rebuild each other's houses, largely because folks in these villages are not served by many NGOs, and it's quite difficult to have the aid reach these places. And so there's quite a tradition and a lot of unity in this area where folks rebuilt on their own. This is actually kind of a combination of parma and connectivity, where you have the women of Yarza village here rebuilding the school, with a donor benefactor who gave money from England. So you have outside money, not from the state, rebuilding the area, but the folks using their own labor source to do the construction. Just one example of the complexity going on in Kashigao. This is also an interesting phenomenon. This is a photo from three weeks ago. Building materials are pretty scarce in Nepal, as are people to do building. I'm sure folks are aware of that. And uh, over here, you know, the rock that's in the village is quite soft. It's metamorphic rock that's not very good for building. So as soon as the landslides happen, it's actually quite advantageous for folks to go to them and harvest the rocks to rebuild their houses. So as soon as the landslides come, you have a big migration of folks to some of the most dangerous areas and doing very, very difficult manual labor in order to get building materials that they're more excited about than the ones they have access to to rebuild their homes something we did not expect until we saw it happening. Let's move now to Gatan and Rasuda district. Uh, you'll notice also quite a cluster of households of where we worked. This is mostly broken up into two settlements, the Gatan settlement and Gray. And the market differences that I shared with you in Kashigao between the different settlements also exist here in Gatan. Gatan settlement here is accessible by road, whereas Gray is slightly accessible by road, but not a common route for folks to go. And Gray, and the, the, where they're at in the recovery, is actually much more similar to Haku VDC than the rest of Gatan VDC. Again, challenging whether or not VDC is the appropriate designation for the recovery, rather than focusing on the ward level or something else. In Gatlang, it's part of the Tamang Heritage Trail. It's a tourist area, definitely not as developed as Longtang. has much more population than Longtang. Um, one of the tourist attractions there was that all the roofs were similar. That has now changed since the earthquake. You can see the temporary roofs in this picture that show a difference in that. Um, we also found in Gatlang, it's predominantly Tamang and folks from Tibet, whereas in the other areas, Kashigao is mostly Gurum, whereas Arutunote is one of the most diverse VDCs, uh, having Nuari people, Gurum folks, and others that I'll share with you when I show the demographics. Uh, this is a puja being done in Gatan for rebuilding because the deities were upset because of the loud noises. This is a Danfe egg, the implying pheasant, being used. I found this quite interesting, also because Gatan is the most served district that we work in by INGOs. It's a INGO circus there that I'll show you with many INGOs working at the same time and doing the same thing. And uh, I found it interesting that there was this cultural aspect commingling with service from external organizations. 
as I told you, there's lots of aid there. We have Islamic Relief, the Mormons, we have Save the Children, we have Australian Aid and UNDP. This is just some of the aid. Everyone here is you're starting to understand the pattern that the aid goes where the road is and it doesn't go where it isn't. I found this picture to be quite striking. It's not the most beautiful picture in the world. It's two toilets. This toilet was built by Save the Children. This toilet was built by Samaritan's Purse. You can tell, ask me or tell me why they decided to build these two toilets facing each other with different architecture. <laughs> also, uh, the one by Save the Children is no more because of a gale force wind storm that happened in April of 2016 that blew away not just this toilet, but some of those temporary roofs and part of the school built by Save the Children as well. Alyssa Rye over here endured this as part of the research and is here to tell the story. Very much appreciated that, it was quite dangerous. Let's now move on to Haku. Haku is very complex, so I need to explain a few things. In Haku, as a random sample of 100 households was picked, only 36 of the households we picked were actually still in Haku, and 64 of those households are in IDP camps. And we wanted to pick the IDP camps to make sure that our research would cover the spread of experiences going on now in Nepal. So what you're seeing here with these clusters, Neishing, Sanohaku, Tulohaku, that's just a portion. You notice there's nobody living over here? That's because of catastrophic landslides that have covered their settlements and they're permanently, not well, semi-permanently in these IDP camps. Some of this is theorized might have come from blasting to create hydropower and maybe destabilize the slopes, but this is unproven. In Haku, it was devastating. Absolutely devastating damage. Many homes, almost actually every home we were there was destroyed. Tulo Haku, to make matters worse, somebody was cooking over an open flame when the earthquake happened and caused a catastrophic fire that burned down over 30 households just after the earthquake happened. So what you're seeing here is the destruction not just from the earthquake but also from the fire. This is resource harvest going on over there right now. It's theorized that there's an intensity in resource harvest since the earthquake because of the desperate state that some folks are in to rebuild. It's quite a big tree. Yeah. Uh, this is a photo from within Tulahaku after the fire. In the uh, background is Lantan Himal. I thought it was quite evocative looking at the sewing machine and seeing the devastation of the house. A fire is not just going to cause that. An earthquake and a fire is going to cause that. Now let's move to the IDP camps that we worked in. You'll notice that those IDP camps are not in Haku. Some of them are actually on the border of the district itself. We worked in 60, with 64 households representing five IDP camps. Dunche being one that's unique, being that it's a semi-urban area now uh, because of the growth of population there since the earthquake. Whereas these other areas are smaller, bizarre areas that have folks in the IDP camps nearby. Here's some photos of the IDP camps just to give you a taste. Some of the IDP camps they theorize, for example this one, might be the permanent relocation place. You can see folks have done a little bit more to make a sense of place there. Some of these other IDP camps, it looks like it could be anywhere in the world after a disaster. Folks here don't really have many options. There's not much to do. Um, and it's quite dire in some places with sanitation issues and other problems. Also, I'd like to share that in Haku, uh, for example, all the toilets were destroyed 100% by the earthquake. So, and sanitation gets reprioritized, as you all know, after a disaster happens. So there's also issues with folks just getting sick and just the circumstances not being great for rebuilding. However, if you have a herd of cows, goats, uh, how yak hybrids, fields, if you let those go, you're losing your wealth as well. So people are put in a very difficult position on whether or not to migrate and go to the camps. The other piece I want to point out is that it's actually easier to get aid in the camps than it is in hot food. So some folks actually want to go to the camps because there are resources there for them, whereas their settlements, as you've seen in the other story, are too far away for them to reach it. So some folks are even claiming their households are bigger or smaller than they are and that there are more of them so that they can receive more payouts because of the desperate situation that they're in. 
Our census showed there were dramatically more households in Haku after the earthquake than there was in the 2011 census. And it's a rural area, and it would be very shocking to me that you're having an urban to rural migration back to Haku, rather than folks actually claiming that there are more there. However, when the census was done, it's also common for folks not to visit all the settlements and to do more of a surface survey. Uh, some progress, January through May. We've already conducted a seven-day, 14-module ethics, theory, and methods training for the entire team that I offer to anyone here in the room as well. In Gorka, Arachinote, and Kashigao, we conducted four community meetings, 200 household surveys, 20 in-depth interviews, and we mapped all the households. In Rasua, Gatlang, and Haku, we did nine community meetings, four informal meetings in the IDP camps, 200 household surveys, 20 in-depth interviews, and the mapping of the households. Which means that our sample size is 400 households and 40 in-depth interviews. The 400 households represent 1,992 individuals. Here's some photos of us conducting the trainings in phase one. Our entire team is there, both the folks from the villages and from Kathmandu. You might recognize a few people in these pictures. I don't know who this man is, but he also helped us out. <laughs> um, also, you'll see that over here with Dr. Mita in the back, we had an advisory group that we put together that Dr. John Andrei is also part of in order to get feedback from a broader scope of people because this project has the potential to last quite a long time. Here's some photos of our community meetings. You'll notice Alyssa here. This is our community meeting in Arachinote. Here's our community meeting in Yartsa and Kashiga. Here's a community meeting in Tulohaku. And here's a community meeting in Sanohaku. Our community meetings in the first phase, we probably had three to 400 people total visit them. We passed out summaries of the project with contact information for myself. We also explained the informed consent process to let folks be aware of the fact that their households were selected, that they had rights to refuse questions, that they weren't obligated to be part of the study, and that also it would be completely anonymous to protect their identities. Now we're in phase two. We've conducted a modified ethics, theory, and methods training for new staff that came from Resources in Malaya. In Gorka, Arachinote, and Kashigao, we've conducted three community meetings with presentations of preliminary results, and we present the results not just of that area, but of all four areas, which has been quite interesting to present the results of the whole study to the entire population. This is new for me in my work. We've conducted 200 household surveys, which will be done with by tomorrow, and four focus groups with key consultants from different backgrounds, such as working with local NGOs, working at the health post, teachers in the schools, and folks that really, really wanted to be part of the study but weren't part of the random sample. Also in Arutunote and Kashigao, we've done GIS mapping and documentation of community level recovery related to infrastructure. We've mapped VDC buildings, health posts, water sources, schools, and religious sites. We've also, we've also mapped the nearest natural hazard, such as landslides and the floodplain, and the proximity to the roadhead. So our, we'll have additional maps. And by the fact that we map the entire sample, we now can layer data in geographically and spatially into the study from the surveys, which is, you know, uh, maps have a whole other way of interpreting information than just numbers or text. Here's some photos. Now we did a little switch when we did the methods and theory and ethics training, where we did some peer learning. So rather than me standing up there and babbling on about all these things, we empowered two of our key staff, Alyssa Rai and Amesh Vasnan, to do some of the training with the new staff themselves, coached by me rather than conducted by me. Here you see Umesh talking about the five indicator variables and the rule of hand. Here we have Alyssa being interviewed by Parvati Guru. Here we have the entire team going over the survey, including Chris starting looking at demographics for mapping. And here we have Alyssa sharing also, what it was like for her to conduct some of the interviews and how friendly the survey is or not is to the population. Here's some more photos of us prepping to go to the field. We also did our own study of the results in order to think which ones 
would be most important and relevant locally. And we did that analysis before we went out into the field. Here are the community meetings that we've conducted so far. Uh, here is community meeting in Yartsa. You'll notice we produced three flex boards. One of them has mapping and photos of each of the communities. One of them has in Nepali, which you see here, some of the preliminary results in all four communities. And we have another one here that has graphs that say some of the results that were in English that we needed to translate. If we had more time, it would all be in Nepali as well. This is our community meeting here in Kashigao. This is our community meeting in Aruchinote. In Aruchinote, we decided to do a PowerPoint presentation rather than using the three flex presentations. Our, our Chinote is unique in our sample in that it has a 77% literacy rate. Folks there are highly educated, and therefore their questions were quite different than the ones that we got in the villages. And we decided that the PowerPoint might be a more useful mechanism for them. Um, I found it to be interesting and useful. We also created a movie to show them all the other four communities with the poly music in the background. If you're interested, we can show it. It's eight minutes long. Uh, this is the meeting we conducted this week, so this stuff is so fresh that this picture is just it's still warm. Um, and this is uh, in the BBC building, and uh, this is Umesh who led the meeting um, conducting that. Okay, so now I want to share with you some of the descriptive statistics on the results that we have. We have not yet done the multivariate statistics because we're waiting for the phase two data to finish being collected. So in general, you're just going to see some basic description of the sample quantitatively. And I have a few fast facts here that I'm going to add into it to give it a little bit more depth. But um, there's a lot more to come. So let's start with the sample demographics. The average age of our respondents were 42.2 years old. Folks can probably predict why this is. The working age, male population at least, were mostly absent from the villages, either working abroad, uh, working, uh, going for Yartsukungu harvest in Manang, uh, we had folks working in portering and tourism, or just you know, rural to urban migration. The average age in the sample was 27 years old, so this is showing you the difference there. Uh, the sex ratio, and I promise you, this just happened, was 199 female and 201 men. <laughs> Alyssa, it just happened, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I think our, our study was blessed in that this is how we got to break it down, but uh, this is how the gender difference was uh, made in the folks we selected from the households to interview. The ethnicity in all our VDCs, you'll notice it's highly Tamang because of Rasua district. Also, big Dale and Gurun populations from the Gorka area, but you'll also see uh, many other different ethnic groups, including Nuari, who were the original inhabitants of Aragat, once the bazaar was built, and others, Dalit folks as well. The average household size in our sample was five per household, a little bigger in average note, a little smaller in Haku. Literacy rates, as I said, for the whole sample was 62%, which is pretty high. 77% in Irish notes. Now, this is just the 400 we interviewed. So, this is not a reflection of the entire 1,992 people. We, we can also, we can't calculate that. We can only do the 400. So, this is what it is for the people that talk to us. Uh, damage to primary house from the earthquakes 99.2%. So, 99.2% of the entire sample had their houses damaged or destroyed. And of that, 81.7% were, were destroyed completely. And 18.3% were damaged. Shocking numbers. Able to return home after the earthquakes, 1%. These are folks in our Chinote, folks who had actually built earthquake resilient homes. Otherwise, everyone else had to stay in temporary shelters, often in the Gulf, in their uh, grazing areas or in their fields often intense, given in the relief phase by outside organizations. IDP camp residents, 16% of our sample, all from Haku. Issues rebuilding after the earthquakes, Haku being, uh, I mean, Arukashigao having the most. Haku's a little bit 
not fair because remember, 36 households are in the field, 64 are in IDP camps. We're actually going to do a separate analysis on Haku because it's so unique. Some of the issues that people had in rebuilding was access to skilled labor, uh, the ability to find construction materials, that the uh, southern border blockade that we all went through, the bond in the south, and that they had family that immediately after the earthquake or before went abroad to a servant's wage labor, and they had nobody to rebuild. Rebuilding with personal funds, Irochinote and Kashi got much higher, got long and Haku much lower. Remember what I told you about service from NGOs. The most served one is Gatlam. Okay? The least served is Kashiga. Okay? Arachinote has the most money because it has the bizarre area. Okay? And we're going to tease this apart a little bit because there are reasons why all this is happening or not happening. We're going to look into some of those variables I told you about. Let's start with connectivity. Help after the earthquakes from family and friends. Kashigao had the most. Why would that be? Well, Kashigao has the greatest tradition of work exchange in Parma that I told you about. They're also the least served by NGOs in the entire sample. They had a tradition of doing things on their own, and they actually rebuilt faster than everybody. So it's kind of an interesting aspect there. Gatlang is the most served area, and Haku, it's a very difficult question because it's not accessible, although their settlement faces Dunche and other areas that are highly served. They see the helicopters flying in and the, and the cars driving in, but they don't come to Haku. Help after the earthquakes from the government. Pretty good. Okay? The first payments that came from the government were all received. Not easily. Some folks had to walk multiple days to get them, but they all came through. And I think this is very important to show that the government was there in the initial response. Help from INGOs after the earthquake. Remember what I told you about Kashiga? And remember what I told you about Gatlan. Okay? Haku was also highly served after the earthquakes. And Arachinote also being an accessible district. Um, the things that the INGOs gave were building materials, clothing, food, and money. Kashiga and Arachinote, on the VDC and ward level, just pooled the funds and decided to use the money for roofing materials and other building materials. Gatlang and Haku did not, and it was just individual. Let's move into livelihood diversity a little bit. Lost livestock during or after the quakes, 37.6%. Highest in Haku. Haku's also the settlement that had the most damage because of the fire and the catastrophic landslides. At earthquakes impact on access to grazing areas. This is a Likert scale from 0 to 3, 0 being none, 3 to being very much. You'll notice Kashigao is very high, Galang and Haku follow. Arachinote being a bizarre area was not as important. Uh, some of the reasons for this were landslides, fissures or cracks caused by the earthquakes, and landslides blocking trails and roads. So landslides both covered the actual grazing areas, but also inhibited the ability to get to them. Earthquakes killed standing crops, all VDCs 57.3%, Haku being the most, Arachinote clearly being the least, just showing you a little bit of how this impacted agriculture. In the institutional context, we did a lot. I'm just selecting a few things I thought you'd find interesting. Do you feel your community's opinion is being taken into account in the recovery? Kashigao is quite high. Gatlang and Haku are quite low. Remember, Kashigao is the least served by external organizations. Gatlang and Haku are more served, right? So their opinion is being taken into account because they're rebuilding themselves. Their opinion is not being taken into account because others are trying to rebuild for them. Do you feel optimistic about the recovery? It's not very good. Do you feel pessimistic about the recovery? It's pretty high. Biophysical attributes. After the quakes, any changes in forest resources? High for Kashigao and Gatlam, a little lower for Haku and Arachinote. Some of these changes included. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Maybe I right. Oh, yeah. Landslides inhibiting the access to non timber forest products. Deforestation caused by resource runs of people taking too much from the forest. 
drought and water scarcity that everybody here experienced between January and about May. And then water sources actually changed where they were after the earthquake, which points to the direction that the water table was affected. Do landslides threaten your community? I told you about Kashigawa. I told you about Haku. It's pretty clear that they're the most vulnerable to that. Arjuno te deem at least. Lastly, social memory. Personal experience with landslides prior to the earthquakes. Kashigawa had the most experience with this. Haku had the least. So that's interesting because Haku was devastated. So this is actually showing some aspects of resilience or adaptive capacity or the lack thereof because of former experiences. Is there a community using any traditional architecture in the recovery? Well, Kashigawa's doing a lot of that. Now why is that? It's because they rebuilt on their own. And that's the way that they know how to rebuild. It's not that it was earthquake resilience. It, these houses were destroyed and they're being rebuilt the old way because they're rebuilding themselves. Some areas like the least, the Haku, you're having, they're expecting to have their whole area rebuilt completely differently with earthquake friendly. I'd also like to point out that none of the designs that were created in Haku, sorry, in Kathmandu are being implemented in any of these areas to rebuild. Mostly you'll see them on a flex banner in the VEC building and they often are, are at the brunt of jokes in that they look as if they would be houses in Kathmandu. Folks also share that the 200,000 rupees is nowhere near enough money to build those houses and also those houses do not have any electricity or plumbing integrated into the design. Those are just a few of the issues, not to mention how expensive it would be to cut brick, rocks into those shapes, different things. They're informed by the quantitative. Each community is recovering at a different pace. Probably figured that out from the results that we have. The speed of recovery is not necessarily dictated by geography or presence or absence of aid. Kashigawa kind of broke all of our expectations. And the spread in our Chinote is something we never would have expected in our hypotheses, that the more accessible area would have wards that are completely destroyed and not being rebuilt at all. Aid does not always match the need. Some places are overserved and others are underserved. Connectivity is key in sourcing resources. So folks, for example, best examples would be Solokumbu or Langtang, where folks had international friends or others that really subverted or circumvented, not subverted, circumvented the existing aid structure so that they could rebuild on their own. The VDC is not an accurate designation of need, and the ward level difference seems to be more clear. The aid is often concentrated at the roadhead, the bazaar, and other accessible locations. And this is nothing new in Nepal. This is just amplifying something that was already there that certain communities were more served than others, and there was not some master equation explaining how one group should then be served versus another. Work exchange or karma is being remade in select locales to rebuild homes, schools, monasteries. From an anthropologist's perspective, this is one of the good stories, that you're seeing culture being enacted as a form of resilience to natural hazards. Planned and in-progress large-scale hydropower projects <coughs> are critical factors in recovery trajectories and decision-making related to the future. It's very difficult to think about rebuilding your house if it's going to be underwater in five years. So what are you going to do with the money that you receive to rebuild? This is a big question. Social memory related to landslides, water scarcity, extreme weather, and, and extreme weather are helpful in the recovery, but not any knowledge of earthquakes. Earthquakes happen too infrequently for folks to have a plan, is what we found. But we found that the cascading effects from earthquakes, big time with landslides, seem to really be one of the biggest factors where folks had knowledge on where to build or how to stabilize slopes, where to look when there's no water, how to conserve water, what to do if there's a lot of rain. These are things people experience more in their everyday life rather than something like a catastrophic earthquake, which as we know happened in Nepal once every hundred years or so. I want to thank all the wonderful people that were part of this project. There's too many to name, but as again, I'm just standing here as a representative of the project. 
and all the folks plus many more that are listed here, including the TU Office of International Relations, which affiliated us with the Central Department of Anthropology, being very important to how we're situated, the Mountain Institute, Resources Himalaya, our senior technical advisors, and our entire incredible staff. This research is being funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation RAPID program, and all the references that I shared are available upon request. Anyway.